Hey, today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Last time we read uh, a little bit further on, verses 1 through 15, uh, but pretty much ended the teaching in the middle of verse 9. So uh, today I'm going to pick up at verse 8 for context and read through verse 16. Now that you've got all those numbers scrambled in your head, I'm going to read from the New King James translation so you can follow along. The Gospel of John, chapter 5, starting at verse 8. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man that said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Good morning. Good morning. Now we're going to begin where we left off last time, John chapter 5, as Jesus heals a lame man that had been afflicted for 38 years. He was at the pool of Bethesda. In the past, after each sign that we read about, uh, or wonder or miracle that's surrounding Jesus, we've been told that people believed in Jesus. Now, granted, there were multiple levels of belief. Uh, these range from a, a head knowledge that here's a man that God had sent to help people, uh, all the way up to a full understanding that Jesus was indeed God himself in the flesh and the promised Messiah. But as we talked about last time, the, the problem with more and more signs and the, the Actually, the criticism that Jesus had of people looking for those signs was that people get used to them and they become dissatisfied and when they don't get bigger and better all the time. Uh, so now we're, we're seeing, we're kind of seeing a, a slight shift in an odd state in the life of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Many of them actually did believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. But because of other pressures in religious and, uh, and in political climates, many of them dared not admit that they really believed in Jesus. <clears throat> and today's text, they clearly see Jesus miraculously healing a man through the power of God right in front of them. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Not only does Jesus immediately cause this man to be able to stand up, which apparently he hasn't done in a long time, but he also tells him to take up his bed. You know, we're not talking about like a king size in your bedroom. We're talking about a, a mat that he basically was, he was laying on there by the pool. And, but now it's time to move on. That's why he's, he said, take up your bed and walk. No more is this man going to have to lay by the pool waiting for somebody to, to help him get in to be healed. Maybe, we don't know for sure. Maybe he waited all day and all night sometimes hoping and begging for someone to help bring him in, hoping for a blessing from an angel from God. But today, for this man, it's moving day. <laughs> you know, what, do, what does he have? He has the clothes on his back, and he's got a mat that he was laying on. But he won't need it anymore there. He's been made well. Now he can get a job. He can work. He can play. He can do all those things that he could only dream about for the last 38 years. Uh, you know, when Jesus heals you, you know, you are completely well. So probably he was better off now being 38 years older than he was before he had this affliction come on him. What an incredible miracle. What a changed life. The past is gone. A new life begins. We read that also as we begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we look at the people around there. And does the scripture say, and they all believe and began to follow Jesus? Sadly, it doesn't. I can't help but think that on the inside that they couldn't help but believe. But outwardly, the ones we see here speaking up are those who are resisting the Holy Spirit of God, trying to convince them of the truth. And instead, they were looking really for anything, any reason they could criticize him. And you know, when a person looks to find fault 
with someone, they'll always come up with something. Even if there's nothing there. Even if they're looking at God. Our life lesson, first life lesson today is seek what is good, not bad. You'll find whatever you're looking for. And good is better. <laughs> seek what is good, not bad. You'll find whatever you're looking for. Good is better. Verse 9 says, And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is a Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now, this is the first time in the Gospel of John that the word Sabbath is used. Now, it's always important to look in the Bible the first time uh, a particular word or, or a concept is used. So we're going to dig into that a little bit more today. The Jewish, the Jewish leaders were telling the man he was breaking the law by carrying his bed, as Jesus had told him to do. Now, they were under Roman rule, uh, so it wasn't against the civil law, the Roman law, but it was uh, against the laws that the Jewish leaders had been put in place and enforced, were enforcing in that day. So the reason we're going to dig a little further today in this is because this conflict was really central. I mean, it kept coming back over and over in every gospel in Jesus' ministry. So there must have been something there that was a, a real uh, stickler point, a very interesting point. So let's take a look at what Sabbath means. The Sabbath, as it applied here, simply means the seventh day. Uh, it comes from the Hebrew, Hebrew word Shabbat or Shavat, which I don't have the accent, sorry, <laughs> but it literally means to rest or to rest from labors. And why is the Sabbath so special? Well, Genesis 2, 1 to 3 tells us exactly why. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested, because in it he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. So what did the God say about the Sabbath? Well, he said a lot. There's no question God didn't want anybody to forget how important it was to honor him, honor the fact that he had created the heavens and the earth and all that was in them. And the Sabbath was a way to do that and also to allow his people to rest their bodies and to focus on their creator, giving him the honor and the remembrance due him. In fact, uh, even though it was established right at the beginning, the, the seven day cycle to rest every seventh day, uh, it was repeated when the Ten Commandments were given. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, it starts out, says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall do labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Pretty awesome, I think. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, <clears throat> you know, when you, when you dig down into it, it's like, okay, well, what are we talking about? Uh, what is meant by work in this case? You, you guys know that sometimes I just, okay, what does this really, really mean? I mean, for me, sometimes this is a lot of work just to get up out of bed. <laughs> so is that work? Um, my chosen profession for uh, several decades, uh, many years, has been video production and editing. And, and I really enjoy doing that. Now, is it actually work because I enjoy doing it? So maybe I could say, well, it's not really work. Does it only count when it's paid work or when you sweat? <laughs> you know, so let's find out what the, what the scripture really says, what the meaning of it is. And, you know, I, I know some churches actually in, in their manuals, they forbid playing certain games, not all games, but just certain games on their day of rest in their manuals. <laughs> you know, so does, does play count as work? I, what kind of play is it? I don't know. There, there's a lot of intricacies and fine lines here. So let's take a look at the Hebrew, where it, where it was written at. The Hebrew word for work here is malacha. Again, my accent, I'll just say malacha. 
And its meaning was, not surprisingly for the context, its meaning was creative, productive work. And it makes sense when you realize that when you see God rested from his work of creating the heavens and the earth, and for, as it applies to us humans, it would include such things as gainful employment and things that we're creating, uh, other, other things are making things. So let's, let's take a look at what it isn't. And that's where, the, that's where we had the conflict in Jesus' day. Did God quit breathing creation, uh, breathing his life into all of creation on that seventh day? I mean, did, all, did the earth disappear? No. I mean, people didn't all die because he stopped helping them breathe. Did the light cease because he quit working? God is light. No, of course not. Did he give up caring and being compassionate on the, just for that one day out of the week? You know, today's our day, I don't, I don't work, I don't care. No, it doesn't happen that way. Um, God said, the scripture said that God, that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Set it apart is what sanctified means. It's not... It's only when you understand that God is generous, he's got a generous desire for all of his children and to be blessed, to be able to recognize his creation, to periodically rest from the duties. When you realize those things, you can experience all that God has for you in, in those. So even after mankind had fallen in the Garden of Eden, the ground was cursed, God still, he wasn't, he's not vindictive, he didn't want man to be overburdened. He didn't want him to wear himself out. Even though he had chosen sin and, and death, uh, he wanted to have him be as healthy as he could. So we, his law incorporated that weekly day of rest. And this was universal throughout Israel and throughout you know, his people that believed and that were in the same area. And so it was, it was put together so that a parent, no parent, or a master or an employer could take an unfair advantage of anyone else. And families could not even take advantage of their animals on their own property. And you said even the cattle within your gates, there's a rest, they're not supposed to work. What an incredibly great plan. Um, there is an interesting omission here. God does not extend that, that command to people who were not believers, who were not Jews, and who were off of your property. Okay, we'll see how that fits in here in a little while, but you know, I'm not sure of all the implications of that, but I do know that even today, um, it's amazing to me, Jews that strictly observe the Sabbath day, which is from sundown on our Friday to sundown on our Saturday, that's the, you know, the evening and the morning were the first day, second day, etc. So that is the actual day that the Sabbath was observed, but the Strict Orthodox Jews, they don't really have a problem asking non-Jews to work on their property for them because they're not under this law. Um, and although they wouldn't dare pump water, go to a you know, well and pump water out or, or operate a generator or, or crank something to cause something else to happen, they don't have a problem with paying the people at the water department <laughs> to pump the water for them or the electric, uh, the electric company to keep the heat on in their house. So there are many, actually many kosher restaurants, I saw this, there's a bunch of them in New York that operate on the Sabbath day, Friday Sunday to Saturday sundown, and Orthodox Jews actually eat at these restaurants or get food from them as long as they don't have to carry it very far to eat it. But there is a restriction. These things, these, these uh, kosher restaurants are operated and owned by non-Jewish people. If it was owned by a Jewish person, first of all, it's not supposed to be open, and the Orthodox Jew would say, no, that would be a violation of the law to make him work. But since it's a non-Jew, it's okay. <laughs> so it's just very interesting, the, the uh, intricacies here. The, the work prohibited was creative work, according to the word of the meaning of the words used. And, and so let's answer some of the questions or try to answer the questions of what specific acts were prohibited here. Uh, and there are really complex writings in scriptures and I'm gonna read these things in a moment um, 
the, the prohibitions, there are actually books, I mean literally big books that are written about this list I'm gonna tell you. And each of these categories had um, paragraphs and paragraphs of details that may or may not have actually been intended by the scripture, by God's command. But some rabbi, somewhere along the line over the last few thousand years, thought this should be included and wanted to clarify, and so they were put down uh, in the traditional Jewish law. There are 39 categories under eight major headings, okay? Major heading one, plant processing for food, which includes sowing, plowing, harvesting, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, and baking. All of that work is prohibited by, this, by the command on the Sabbath. Uh, the second category is animal processing for clothing, which includes shearing wool, bleaching it, hackling it, I don't even know what that means, dyeing it, spinning, stretching the threads, making two meshes, weaving two threads, dividing two threads, tying, untying, sewing two stitches, or tearing in order to sew two stitches. Okay, again, that's creative work. Uh, I'm, I'm great with that. Animal processing for food, which includes hunting a deer or other animals that are uh, clean to eat, slaughtering it, flaying it, salting it, curing its hide, scraping it, and slicing it. That's all work that's prohibited on, on the Sabbath. Writing, which includes writing two letters. I'm not sure why one was okay, but two wasn't. I guess when you write two letters, that could actually be a creative work. And, and the second thing is erasing in order to write more letters, or in order to write two letters. The next category is construction, building anything or tearing down anything. Uh, another one is making fire to manufacture, including extinguishing a fire, putting it out, or kindling it to get it started. Um, finishing work, there's another category including, and it's kind of the final hammer blow is what's given, or the, you know, hammering something. Um, and apparently that's a reference to putting like final gold on decorative beams of wood or, or you know, finishing out something, a decorative piece. And then the, the last category, the last major heading is moving objects in specific ways, such as transporting from one domain to another, from a private home to a public place, or vice versa, or moving it more than a certain distance in a public place or a private place or passing through doors of certain sizes. Okay, so those are, those are the prohibitions that we have uh, in the, the Jewish law. This is what the, the scribes, the Pharisees uh, of Jesus' day were experts in. They knew, you know, in their brain, they, they studied, they knew all these volumes and um, it was the interpretation of that last prohibition that made the, Jew, the Jewish leaders in, in our story and throughout the Gospels made them want to kill Jesus. Okay? It's also where I am likely, very highly likely to get in trouble with the Jewish scholars myself. Okay? And actually most of the prohibitions on the list, including the last one, are supposed to be based on Scripture so as to honor God. Now, when you're looking it up, I looked and I looked and I looked. Uh, and I finally did find, in one place out of many, I found a place that actually referred to the scriptures that were supposed to be supporting each of these areas and supporting the, the transporting from one domain to another. Um, and the problem I have with that is that, to, well, to me, and I hope to you, the authority that God has comes to us through scriptures. That's the authority. Now, when it goes through men, a man or dozens of men, <laughs> to, to end up coming to us, it can get adjusted, it can get changed, it can get amplified, or it can get de-emphasized. And, um, you know, it, to, to me, it's, it, when you're depending on books and books written by man rather than one statement from God, there can be a lot of, a lot of corruption in there, okay? 
But you know, on, on first view, these things that we talked about here, all these, these prohibitions make sense. Um, making food, make, building buildings, manufacturing goods, creating art. But the Jewish law that's been built up around those are cumbersome at the very least. And we do see the scriptures uh, in the, the New Testament talk about this law. And the, the majority of the law that the New Testament talks about, when it talks about the law, is these extra things. And especially around this 39th, uh, this 39th piece, the moving of things from one place to another on the Sabbath, that was really the focus of just about everything, every criticism that people had. And it was, you know, it was a death penalty. The worst penalty is the death penalty uh, in, in the Jewish law. And so it was a very threatening to people that were there. Um, now, give you, a, give you an idea of just one idea, one thing that was beyond, I believe beyond the scriptural intention. There is a prohibition on shearing, you know, and cutting wool off of, off of uh, animals, especially sheep, to be used for clothing. It makes sense. That's work. But it doesn't make sense when it prohibits combing your hair because, well, it doesn't happen so much for me anymore, but you could pull out a hair. A hair could get stuck in the comb when you're combing your hair. Uh, and so that, that's prohibited on the Sabbath under the Jewish law, or biting a fingernail that starts getting aggravating for you, or pulling off a piece, a loose piece of dead skin. Uh, these are, again, there are entire books re written on these details that, um, and, and these things, you know, honestly, I, I, I don't, I really, really don't believe in my heart that combing my hair or, or biting my fingernail on the Sabbath day is dishonoring to God, to the Sabbath, or anything like that, yet, these are, these are laws made by men that were added and are considered serious offenses. And this, this is going somewhere, okay? I know this is, this is long. <clears throat> but even beyond these books, if you were to memorize every, every law, every uh, adjustment of every piece on every page um, and, and know them by heart, they even tell you that you should uh, consult an authority, a competent authority on their books if you have any questions to clarify them. And see, that's exactly what the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' day were doing. It was their job, it was their righteous duty, so to speak, to interpret the man-made laws that they say were derived from the Torah and to teach people these laws and to enforce these laws. And where we have a problem here is that I'm sure it made them feel important. Uh, and more significantly, it gave them power over people that God had never intended that to happen. They could observe, they could observe just about anything that someone was doing and interpret it somehow as a violation of the Sabbath law and demand that person be severely punished for breaking the Sabbath. So what happened? We see God wanted this to be a day of rest and remembrance and honoring of him. And man turned it into a day that was full of fear and anxiety. Oh, I can't move, I can't do this, I can't do that, I've got to stop this. Oh, you know, I, I, oh no, I, I might have wiped off a piece of dead skin when I scratched an itch. I mean, it, it was terrifying to the people. And yet they had learned to live with it because that's, they wanted to honor God. And that's what they were being taught was honoring. Now, by the way, does it seem a little strange to y'all that the people whose job it was to interpret the laws were actually violating their own laws by doing their work, by aggressively interpreting these laws and prosecuting them on the Sabbath? Our life lesson for us here, there's a point. <laughs> Our life lesson is don't add layers and complexity to the word of God. Be blessed by his commands, not adding to them for your own selfish purposes. Don't add layers and complexity to the word of God. Be blessed by his commands, not adding to them for your own selfish purposes. And that brings us again back to our text. The Jewish law that was broken here was a prohibition on carrying things from a private building to a public building and vice versa and it also included carrying an item more than seven feet in public. 
I don't know where that came from. <clears throat> but the scripture that this was based on was in Jeremiah, and it was clearly denouncing the practice of carrying tribute and merchandise into Jerusalem, through the gates of Jerusalem, and also carrying out portage from your homes, essentially carrying cargo from your homes, making something at your house, and then taking that cargo on the Sabbath and shipping it out to other places. That's very clear in the scripture that they say that, that, <clears throat> that these rules are based on. Yet, that <laughs> picking up your mat after being healed it does not seem to me like it would be is carrying tribute or, or selling, you know, <laughs> making a, a, a public transportation of uh, manufactured goods. <clears throat> But, you know, they, these things that, that God had prohibited on the Sabbath were, you know, these creative and occupational works. And um, he wanted his people to rest from those. And he had to have the whole community be involved in this so that everybody would be benefited from it. You know, I, I think these men were probably standing around. They, they asked questions that they knew the answers to. You know, who, who is it that told you? But I think they were probably watching him be healed, which is not prohibited on the Sabbath, and then picking up his bed. Now, picking up your bed is not pro prohibited. And actually, if you have a heavy couch and you dragged it all the way through the house, that's not prohibited. But if you pick up a pillow and move it seven feet or more, that's prohibited. Okay, so I think they were just watching him do this waiting till they got seven feet away from where he picked it up at and then jumped on this opportunity to chastise them, telling them how he was a lawbreaker and demanding, who told you this? Although they probably knew. Verse 11, he, the formerly lame man, answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man that said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now again, do you, do you find it a little bit more than ironic here that they were more concerned about this man who is now well, carrying a relatively light sleeping mat on the way on the Sabbath than they were about 38 years of Sabbaths that someone had to probably pick this man up and carry him over to the pool and then sometime that day pick him up again and carry him away from the pool. Had to have happened thousands of times on the Sabbath. You don't see that they're complaining about that happening. They're not even happy that that's not going to happen anymore. So, again, there's a, there's a, there's an irony, there's conflicts in here. And it's not only uh, me and you that notice that. You'll also see in a few minutes that uh, Jesus noticed that as well. But at this point, we, it seems we have two views of who Jesus is right here. To the religious leaders, who is Jesus? Jesus was the one that made them uncomfortable and even made them mad in their narrow view because he was the horrible man who told this other man to break the Sabbath. <clears throat> to the healed man, who did he say? He who made me well. What a difference. What a, what a perspective. When Jesus touches you, when Jesus does something for you, your perspective changes. And our life lesson here is determine who Jesus is to you. The one who makes you mad or the one who makes you well. Determine who Jesus is to you. The one who makes you mad or the one who makes you well. Our text continues in verse 13. But the one who was healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Now as you as we talked about last week when, when this uh, occurred, uh, this man had no idea who Jesus was. Not a clue. It was not his belief. It was not his faith. It was not his actions. It was not the prayers of his mama. It was just the simple love and compassion that, and, and pity that Jesus had on this person who had been laying there for years it was that compassion that, that made a difference in his life. And so he's like, okay, who is this guy? The gospel writer was, was focused on and getting this account across, um, not 
on rabbit trails like I do so often. So I don't know in this how much time had passed, whether this was five minutes or five hours. Um, I don't, you know, he, he doesn't record how many other miraculous things that happened there uh, at this, at this, around this pool where there were a multitude of lame people, you know, sick, lame, blind, deaf. Um, but with so many people, we know that Jesus could get weary with so many people around, maybe a lot of healings, or I don't know, maybe just the, the power of, uh, to, that, was, uh, that came from him to heal this man. Jesus could become weary. And so he had withdrawn, he'd, got, he'd slipped away, and wasn't easily found in this multitude. But see, Jesus had not finished with this man yet. I don't know, and honestly, I don't think Jesus wanted to, to jump right in into a conflict after you know being able to help this man. I don't, I don't think he wanted to make a big deal of the conflict right then. But he knew that man would be, was facing a hard time from the religious people that were there. He wanted to give him long lasting strength and advice. So it says in verse 14, and afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you've been made well. Sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. Now, Jesus' concern was for this man's, first for his spiritual health, not just his physical health. Um, we speculated last week that because of this, it may have been um, what we call a, a, a self-induced infirmity that this man had because Jesus is telling him, sin no more, let something else worse. It may have been his own sin that caused it. We know that nobody would, would bring him into the pool. No one would help him get healed. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that's kind of the, how this verse ties into what we taught last week. But he confirmed that he'd been made well. It wasn't a quick fix. You know, Jesus doesn't just put a Band-Aid on and say, you know, just watch that for a few weeks and make sure and come back and see me. Uh, let's set the appointment up for 2 o'clock on Thursday. <laughs> he, he doesn't do that. He's totally healed, totally well. Uh, didn't just give him a meal in a room for the night. He gave him a life back. With, G with that, Jesus also wanted to make sure his soul was well and to prevent worse things from happening to him. And, and I can't help but think that Jesus' concern for the healed man here was, um, was on the apostle's mind, Apostle John, who, who recorded this for us. Because he writes in, in 3 John, um, verses 2 to 4, to one of his friends, Gaius. He said, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. So, you know, that, that stuck with John. I mean, John was very old when he wrote that to Gaius. And, uh, but he was, he was still thinking. I think he was still thinking about, you know, even Jesus went back and said, you know, took some time with him. Jesus, John, Jesus understood and John learned that these things, um, there are worse things in life being, than being afflicted and lame. Um, and that is one of the worst things that's worse than not being able to walk is being able to walk, but walking in sin. There are undoubtedly more words to the conversation between Jesus and the, the healed man, which will remain private between them for right now. Maybe we'll find out in eternity, but the man now knew who Jesus was. And it's also likely that he wanted to avoid at that point, Jesus had just told him, sin no more. He wanted to avoid even the appearance of sin or wrongdoing. The Jewish leaders had asked him who it was and he felt obligated to go and tell them. Verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made them well, made him well. <coughs> now, I, I think the man was actually pretty brave here. Um, knowing the penalties that they may have been seeking against him uh, for his violation, um, he went back and told them anyway. You know, some people say he did it out of fear for the, from the Jewish leaders, but I don't think so. I think he was bold. I think he was unafraid. He had been built up by the words that Jesus talked to, talked to him. And, um, you know, he could have been, you know, prosecuted. He could have been excommunicated for the, for the Jewish leaders, for the supposed crime that he had done. But he wanted everybody to know what Jesus had done for him, starting with the leaders. 
our life lesson thing that applies to us today is regardless of the possible consequences, stand up and tell others what Jesus has done for you. Regardless of the possible consequences, stand up and tell others what Jesus has done for you. Now, today, looking back, it's fairly easy to see through the leaders um, as we have the scriptures, we have understanding of them, we have the hindsight of history, but there are still some things that we can learn today from this. We see in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus took the opportunity, even as a guest of a high-ranking high religious leader, to, and pointed out the hypocrisy of the way religious leaders taught and expected others to obey, and the way them, they themselves acted. Luke 14, 1-6 says, Now it happened as he went out to the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus, answering, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees. This is with the, with the lame man right in front of him. says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? <laughs> so they say, give me your opinion. Verse 4, but they kept silent. And he, Jesus, took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them that were around him, which of you having a donkey or an ox that's falling into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him concerning, regarding these things. Now there's some great lessons in Luke's account here, <laughs> but I don't, I'm not here to teach this one again. But one of the things that's often missed in this passage is I think the very thing that caused these guys to just keep their mouths shut. It's not so much that they worked to pull their animal out of the pit on the Sabbath. That's actually an act of compassion and mercy, that, and, and I don't think that's forbidden. I know it's not forbidden in God's command. The real stickler here was that apparently every Pharisee that was there had made their animals work on the Sabbath day, which was a direct violation of God's command. And that, that nobody in the family, the employment, even the animals inside their gates were not supposed to be working. And yet, they, they, what could they say? They couldn't say a thing. Mark 2, 27 to 28, Jesus makes a very, very clear statement on why the Sabbath was important. And this is where we need to learn a lot. And it's a lot of the background that you we've talked about today brings us to these points. Verse 27, uh, 28 say, And he said to them, The Sabbath... The day of rest was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now let's, let's plug in the actual meaning of those words. And he said to them, The day of rest was made for man and not man for the day of rest. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the day of rest. Makes a lot of sense. God created the Sabbath for the sake of rest. It's meant to be a blessing. Uh, for those that want to properly observe the Sabbath, today it can be a source of confusion. Okay? Many sincere Christians are, are really in a great deal of turmoil over this. Just as the Sabbath was one of the main points, uh, stickler points in Jesus' day, of, in points of conflict, it can be that way today among believers. There are some groups that teach that if one does not observe the Sabbath on Saturday, they're receiving the mark of the beast and are forever doomed. I have no idea how that came. <laughs> but, you know, they, they basically they're insisting that the Roman Catholic Church corrupted all of Christianity. They're so concerned about these things that they lose their focus on sharing Jesus with the lost world. For others, they totally ignore the special blessings of the day. They don't experience the rest, the mercy, and the compassion that Jesus emphasized on his work here on earth. And they miss out on the point. So we, we need to balance and, and have this. And let's, let's find out what the balance is that, uh, that we have as, as New Testament believers, as, as uh, believers in Jesus. In every account, in, I mean, in every gospel account, there is conflict with the Jewish leaders concerning the Sabbath. But what happens afterwards in the church and in particularly as it applies to us today? Well, in Acts chapter 18, after the Jews opposed Paul, teaching that Jesus was the Messiah and blasphemed him, Paul declares that from then on he would take the message of Christ to the Gentiles. And even though Paul relented and 
you know, we see right away he spent several weeks, I believe it was, in, in the Jewish leader's home teaching him and the others. Um, the word Sabbath, the, the idea of the Sabbath was never again mentioned in the book of Acts. In fact, uh, there's only one other time in the New Testament that the word Sabbath is mentioned, and that is uh, the, the Bible's last statement. It's Colossians 2, 16 to 17. And just to, to bring the most meaning into it, I'll read it in the Amplified Version. Therefore, let no one judge you in regard to food and drink or in regard to the observance of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Such things are only a shadow of what is to come and they have only symbolic value. But the substance, the reality of what is foreshadowed belongs to Christ. Y'all can read it again if you want to. I'm going to move along. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. This statement is the conclusion of the early church on this matter and is never again controversial. It's not addressed in the scripture, except in the broad sense that the Gentile believers, that's me, I don't know about y'all, but that's me, are not to be put under the Jewish law. In fact, uh, for a bit of homework, you know, I like to give a little homework. Uh, study out Colossians chapter 2 and the surrounding scriptures. Uh, if you struggle. And we also see uh, the freedom that we are given in Christ in Romans 14. And Paul's conclusion is also here. Starting in verse 5, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let us therefore not judge one another anymore but rather resolve this, not to be, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. This should not be a divisive issue in the church, should not be a divisive issue in your home. Um, you know, God wants you to rest on, you know, your, 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 and, and honor him a day every week. There's so much in Romans 4, more in Fort Romans there's so much more in Romans 14 on this. So put that on your homework list to study this chapter as well. Um, and let me point out here that Paul in no way denounced or abandoned his Jewishness in this. Okay? And he was the one that just wrote what I read to you. Uh, and in fact, in Galatians 1, 13 to 14 and Philippians 3, 4 to 6, he says... And I advanced Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in this nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father, fathers. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrew, Hebrews. Concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is the law, blameless for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it you see Paul admits that he was even against the church trying to destroy it as we read more in these chapters we find out that Paul wasn't changing religions or rejecting his Jewish heritage no it was spending time with Jesus being taught by Jesus understanding the freedom he had in Christ, understanding how the law was really applied, what the law was really intended to do for mankind. And it was not that he should be under bondage to the law. He understood these things and he shares with us these conclusions. Now also the scripture establishes that we're, being, we're to be given the freedom to follow our own consciences, consciences in this matter. So, and, and not be critical of others who do that. So if a group of believers prefers to meet on Sunday, they're free to do so in the, in the glory of God, for, for God's glory. If a di different group would prefer to meet on another day, on, the, on a Saturday or on a Friday evening after sundown, which is the, the Sabbath, they should not feel condemnation nor criticism from other believers. The New Testament established that meeting on a certain day is no longer the issue. Rather, the issue is keeping the spiritual principles of the Shabbat, Shabbat or the Sabbath. Now I'd love to get into Hebrews 4 which goes into this more but time is gone today. <laughs> so uh, that's your homework. 
Hebrews 4. You got a lot of homework, guys. <laughs> so uh, I hope this has provided some clarity to you on these issues from the Word of God. Uh, please understand how much God loves you and how God wants to bless you, not because of what you do, how you do it, or when you do it, but because He chooses to bless you. As we depart, I'm going to play a, pray a blessing over you from God's Word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now next week we'll continue where we left off today. We're going to see the response of the religious leaders. And more importantly, we're going to see the response of Jesus as he teaches some very important things. And uh, as we depart, if there's anything you'd like for us to pray about you, just ask me or Mitzi, and we'd love to pray for you. God bless you. Thanks for being here.